Hello everyone. Thank you for standing by, and welcome to our webinar, Shaping Baby Brains, Stress Regulation and Infant Toddler Development. My name is Nancy Holtzman. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Content and Online Learning here at ISIS Parenting. I'm also a mother baby nurse specialist and board certified lactation consultant. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen only mode. However, you may submit questions to us at any time by typing them through the chat feature located to the left of your screen. We've incorporated many of the already submitted questions into the presentation and we'll take additional questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. This webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a link to the recording by email tomorrow along with additional resources. So if you miss something or need to step away for any reason, that's okay. ISIS Parenting is pleased to offer this edition of our Expert Speaker Webinar Series. ISIS is the nation's most trusted prenatal and early parenting destination. We partner with hospitals to provide innovative programs, classes, and services for childbirth, breastfeeding support, and infant toddler sleep, as well as early parenting education and developmental programs. We offer classes and a highly edited selection of products for expecting and new families online and in our 13 centers located in Boston, Massachusetts, Atlanta, Georgia, and the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Visit our website at isisparenting.com to learn more. As I mentioned, I'm Nancy Holtzman, and I'll be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to introduce you today to today's speaker, Amanda Terullo. Dr. Terullo is an assistant professor of psychology and the director of the Brain and Early Experiences Lab, the B-Lab, at Boston University. Prior to joining the faculty at BU, she completed a postdoctoral research fellowship at Columbia Re University where she obtained training in infant electrophysiologic research methods. She received her PhD in child clinical psychology from the Institute of Child Development at the University of Minnesota where she studied the effects of orphanage rearing on brain development. In the B lab, she studies how families nurture early brain development and identifies patterns of brain activity that predict social, cognitive, and language development. Current studies focus on how early social interactions influence development of social brain circuits, how mothers help their infants to regulate stress, and the neural basis of attention in preschool children, and how parents help their toddlers to learn language. She is the mother of two. Welcome, Dr. Terullo. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you to ISIS Parenting. I'm really happy to be here today, and um, I appreciate all of you who submitted questions in advance, and I will try to work those into the presentation. Um, and if you have questions as we go along, please do submit those, and we look forward to uh, going over those at the end, as many as we have time for. Um, so let me just start out by saying, as I'm sure all of you have heard, the first five years of life, and particularly the uh, infant period, is a very rapid period of brain development. Um, but some people have the misconception that the brain is just ticking along and that it's going to develop in the same way no matter what you do. Uh, and that is not the case. It's not genetically predetermined. Um, the brain really depends heavily on the child's early experiences to shape developing brain circuitry. Uh, in particular, uh, experiences with caregivers play an active role in shaping the brain's architecture. And what I mean by architecture is structures within the brain and connections between brain regions. Um, all of that, some of that occurs before birth, but a lot of brain development is occurring uh, during infancy and early childhood. And those uh, connections between brain regions are very much shaped by children's experiences and especially early experiences. Brain development does continue all the way through childhood and adolescence, uh, but it is most concentrated in this early period of development, and so um, a lot of caregivers um, are interested in what they can do to, to uh, help their children's brains to develop in a healthy way. So here are the three basic needs for healthy brain development from birth to five years. First and foremost, and what we'll be spending the most time on today, is relationship needs. Relationships with caregivers are absolutely critical for normal social development. Um, and part of that is because you're shaping your child's social brain network uh, through caregiver interactions in, the, uh, in infancy and early childhood. Um, but 
also the brain is developing in the context of uh, nutritional needs. So nutrients are very important for different uh, functions and processes of brain development. We'll talk more about that. Um, and then finally, um, sleep needs. So sleep is crucial for brain development. It's a time when uh, children consolidate what they've learned while they were awake, um, and it, they, their learning is really optimized by having adequate sleep. And if they don't have adequate sleep, it's hard for them to function well, as I'm sure you all know from experience. I sure know from experience what happens when my kids don't have a good night's sleep. Uh, so those are the three main topics that we're going to go over today, and I'll just go ahead and get started with talking about relationship needs. So caregivers help children to build connections between brain regions. All of the things that you do with your kid on a daily basis, playing, comforting your kid, helping them to manage stress, talking, teaching your kid about relationships, every one of those activities at the same time as you're, doing, as you're taking care of them in daily life, you're also helping them to build connections between brain regions. Um, and those neural connections that develop through your sensitive and responsive care of your child um, Set your child up with the foundations that they need when they get a little older to learn, to pay attention, to develop social skills, and to manage their emotions. So by helping them to build connections between brain regions, you're really setting them up for success when they get a little older and need to function a little more independently. So one of the most important functions um, as a caregiver is to help your kid to manage stress. So uh, one of the uh, biological stress systems um, that you may have heard about uh, has a stress hormone called cortisol. And that system is very immature when babies are born. And so the stress systems of infants and young children are immature. And they can't regulate themselves. They're not capable of regulating themselves in infancy and particularly in the newborn period. So these young children are depending on sensitive caregivers to help them to manage stress. Um, and so that's great news if, you ha if the child has a sensitive caregiver because they can really respond to your caregiving and that can help um, keep their stress hormones in check. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, how that works. Okay, so... So um, newborns are highly stress reactive. Um, and some of you may have experienced yourself or know people uh, who the doctors knew that they were going to deliver a little early, and they went ahead and gave the mom um, injections of a synthetic cortisol hormone um, in order to help mature the baby's lung tissue so that when they were born, they would be able to uh, breathe on their own. Um, so if a baby is born on time, that rise in cortisol, in the stress hormone cortisol, happens anyway, happens naturally. So newborns are basically flooded with cortisol, and it's because cortisol spikes up towards the end of pregnancy, and that's great. It's important because it's helping the baby to get ready for the transition from the womb to outside the womb and be able to breathe on their own. Um, However, what that means is because they're flooded in stress hormones, it takes very little to elevate stress hormones in newborns. So this picture shows something that every newborn goes through, being weighed at the doctor's office. Not getting shots, just being weighed is enough for their hormone, stress hormones to skyrocket. Now, if you, you might say, well, that seems like nothing. Why, is it, why, is there, why are they so reactive to that? Um, but if you think about it for a moment, it's cold. Their limbs are flailing all around. Um, you know, it's very different than what they're used to, which is being very secure and wrapped up in the womb without much room to move around. So it's quite different from their experiences. Um, but still, it's, though that kind of thing is going to happen all the time, changing a diaper, giving a bath, the baby's going to have lots of daily experiences to which a newborn is going to elevate stress hormones. But something interesting goes on over the first year of life. So we obviously can't ethically as researchers stress babies out um, for no reason, but researchers have taken advantage of well baby exams. So those of you who have infants, you might feel like you're always in the pediatrician's office. I sure feel like we're going there every five minutes uh, because there are so many well baby exams and so many vaccinations over the first year of life. So researchers have taken advantage of this because being weighed um, and unjust and weighed and the shots um, are stressful for babies. And that's happening anyway. And so what they've done is to measure the baby's cortisol, their stress hormone level, before and after the doctor's visit that they're going to have anyway. Um, the way that you measure stress hormones is just from the baby's saliva. So that, that part is really non-invasive for them. Um, and what they've discovered is that even when babies appear upset, 
their stress system stays under control at a biological level if a sensitive caregiver is present. So let me show you how that works. So in this graph here, the baby's aging months is shown across the x-axis. And this is a combination of research from a number of different labs, including uh, Megan Gunner at the University of Minnesota, but different researchers study babies at different ages. And so this graph kind of takes all their findings and puts them together. So in the y-axis, what you're seeing is the increase in cortisol, in stress hormones, in response to having a doctor's exam and getting shots. And what you see is that with a two-month-old, the first time they come in to get their vaccination, their cortisol goes way up when they have um, the doctor's exam and shots. There's a real escalation in stress hormones. By four and six months, that escalation is smaller, and by a year of age, they don't show a rise in stress hormones at all. Now, some people say, well, maybe they just habituated to it. They got used to it. But what I would point out to you is that the, the line at the top there is showing you they're crying. Cry a lot all the way through, two months, four months, six months, 12 months, 15 months, 18 months. They always cry. So behaviorally, they're continuing to appear stressed out by the situation, but at a biological level, they're no longer stressed out by the time they're one year old. And even earlier in infancy, it's somewhat buffered. Um, and what is happening here is that uh, the, the parent, the sensitive caregiver, is buffering that child's stress response. That because the parent is holding the child while they get the shot and is right there and the child can see them while they're having the exam, they find it less stressful at a biological level. The parent is helping the child to manage stress. Um, I, I, this is a finding that as a parent personally I really love because there's so many times when your kid is crying and you just can't get them to stop crying. They have a stomach ache or they're just overtired or whatever. Not just the shots, but there are lots of times where the kid is crying and I, I feel like it's really helpful to know that just even if you can't get them to stop crying, the fact that you're there and you're holding them, you're comforting them, is helping them at a biological level. It's helping to buffer their system from stress um, even though they, behaviorally they might still appear upset. So, you know, don't put down the kid and walk out of the room. You're still helping by being there and, and staying with them through the stressful experience. So all of that, your power to help, uh, help your child to manage stress through being sensitive and responsive and through having a good relationship with the child um, is wonderful news if you're there and if you're able to be sensitive and responsive. But on the other hand, children who are unlucky enough to be in situations where they don't have sensitive responsive care are very vulnerable because they can't regulate their own stress. And so if they don't have a caregiver who's consistent and who's there for them, um, then they are going to tend to have stress hormone levels that are either too high or too low. Um, and too high can be because uh, the stress system just kind of goes haywire, but too low sometimes if they're chronically stressed for a long time, then it's as if the system almost shuts down, and that's not good either. Um, so it, it's very concerning that kids who are in situations of maltreatment um, or uh, when they're moved from one placement to another in the foster care system so that there's a lot of relationship disruption, they tend to have abnormal levels of stress hormones. Uh, but there's hope here. And the good news is that um, Phil Fisher at the University of Oregon did a study where he placed children who had been maltreated um, in an intensive foster care intervention program, therapeutic foster care, where the parents were given a lot of coaching on sensitive responsive caregiving. And what happened over time was that their cortisol became more normal. Their daily rhythms of stress hormones began to look more like um, kids who were just lived with their families and had never had that kind of disruption. Um, however, when kids were in typical foster care where the parents didn't have special training in, in how to um, be sensitive and responsive with a child who might be a particularly difficult child, um, then that we didn't see that kind of improvement. So this kind of finding really offers hope that intensive intervention program, uh, programs can help to normalize brain function so that just because a child has had uh, severe early life stress doesn't mean that, that it's a lost cause by any means at all. Um, and by providing uh, sensitive responsive care, um, the system is resilient and the system can get back to closer to normal um, functioning. And I want to just take a moment here to acknowledge uh, somebody submitted a question asking about um, if a child is over age 3 and has had either orphanage rearing or other um, chronic early life stress, what can you do to try to normalize their stress functioning and what are the markers, uh, physiological markers that you could look at to try to see your success? Um, so I think this study is a good example of that. And there's been a number of studies um, with kids internationally adopted from orphanages as well as with uh, children who were in foster care showing that really 
the most powerful intervention is placement in a loving family, and that that placement in a loving family um, really over time, over a period of a few months to a year, um, leads to normalization of daily levels of cortisol. Um, so that's what you can do, and you're probably already doing it. Um, and research studies look at these markers of cortisol to, to, uh, to see how interventions are working or not working. As far as I know, I don't think that they are currently used at a clinical level um, for kids who are not in research studies, um, but the findings are so consistent that I think you can be pretty confident that um, by being in a loving family, um, that's going to lead to a lot of improvement. Now one thing I did before I go on, I just want to do, mention that one thing that is more challenging is that kids who have experienced early life stress um, may be more reactive to stressful challenges in their life. And that may be something that's harder to, um, harder to, to uh, change. Um, and so for that, teaching our kids strategies to manage frustration um, are really important. And uh, biofeedback can also be important. That's where um, for slightly older children where they can see changes in their heart rate and respiration as they employ strategies like uh, relaxation breathing. Um, and being able to see how they're calming themselves down um, can be effective too. Um, so these are, those are all uh, things to consider. And we actually, um, ISIS has a prior webinar that was particularly about helping kids to manage frustration. We, um, Nancy will send out links for afterwards. Okay, so I want to um, just define a, a little bit of language. Um, one is this term plasticity, um, and that's the capacity of the brain to be affected by experience. How plastic is the brain? How changeable is the brain? Um, and your brain is the most plastic, the most um, responsive to experiences and changeable as a result of experiences in early childhood and infancy. That means that on the one hand, if things don't go well for the child, then that's going to have a big impact on the brain. But on the other hand, interventions are really powerful because the brain is, is very plastic and able to change in response to um, improvements in, in uh, their experience. Um, something else I want to talk about is sensitive periods. Um, sensitive periods are prime times basically, windows of time when the brain is especially sensitive to certain kinds of experiences. So an example from the animal world, um, migratory birds actually while they are still in the nest, they, have, they look up and see the stars and they learn how to navigate by seeing the stars. So there was a study done where they put uh, the, the birds in like a fake planetarium where they were seeing like the wrong way out of stars that aren't really where the constellations are. And then when it came time for them to fly up into the sky and migrate, they went the wrong way as if the, the sky was arranged like what the planetarium ceiling had looked like. So they, they were learning that information and their brain was being in how to navigate while they were infants in the nest. And then they needed that information in order to use it to fly and they couldn't figure it out later. They had to get it at the right time. So, that's you know, a kind of diabolical study, but I think it dramatically makes the point that sometimes um, experiences need to happen at the right point in development. Um, and the same thing is true in humans. So it, uh, note that it's sensitive periods, not critical periods. Um, sometimes critical periods is an old term, which meant that if you miss the window, forget it. Um, and sensitive periods, I think, is, is a more flexible term showing that the brain is most responsive to experiences um, and most ready to learn at certain times in development, but that there can still be some impact um, later on. So um, obvious ones are vision. Um, you know, babies, if they have a lazy eye, a strabismus, that needs to be corrected right away. Um, and they need to you know, wear the patch and, and have surgery pretty early uh, because otherwise, um, once the visual pathways have finished developing, then it's, it's too late to be able to fix it. Um, language development is another one. Babies need to be exposed to language early. That's when their brain is most receptive um, to learning language. And you know, if you know, sometimes if you if you look at families that have moved from another country, you'll see that the parents and children who were you know ad adolescents at the time that they moved, no matter how long they stay in the new country, will always have accents and will always have. Uh, the new language is not perfectly fluent, whereas young children, it's as if they're native speakers. They are native speakers because their brain is more plastic and they're still in the sensitive period for language learning so they can learn it perfectly. Um, but the third one that I really want to concentrate on today is attachment development. It's developing, bonding with the parent and developing a relationship with you. And there's more and more evidence that there is a sensitive period for attachment um, and that it is important for a child to have those sensitive, responsive caregiving experiences early in life. 
So as we're talking about kids' relationship needs, um, you know, it's very common for moms to experience postpartum depression. Um, and what does that do to kids' relationship needs? Well, we know that in responding to their infants, depressed moms tend to be less sensitive and contingent, less involved in um, uh, turn-taking kind of play with their kids, um, more likely to have some hostile speech and, and more negative touch, and um, tending to be either withdrawn from the interaction or a little intrusive and not reading the baby's cues. Well, I mean, this makes sense. If you're feeling overwhelmed and depressed, it's awfully hard to be present in the interaction with your infant. It's hard for everybody anyway, and if you are trying to cope with depression at the same time, that's overwhelming for anyone. Um, so what can you do to try to help um, make sure that your kids' relationship needs are being met um, while you're also trying to cope with your own uh, mental health needs? Well, there's a few things. One is make sure that you, are, if you're feeling overwhelmed, are not alone 24-7 with your child because you're not the only one who can have contingent interactions. You don't have to take on the whole burden yourself. Having your child in high quality early child care or having the father or the partner or any other caregivers um, involved on a daily basis is a protective factor. There's research showing that um, kids of moms who are experiencing postpartum depression tend to do better if they also have interactions with other people um, so that they have lots of sources of that kind of contingent, sensitive, responsive interaction. Um, the other thing is uh, parenting support. So basically the way that maternal anxiety or depression is likely to affect um, a child is through parenting with you. So there are so many studies showing that no matter what moms are feeling themselves, if they are able to somehow buffer their child from that and be present in the interaction with their child, then the kids look great. Then the kids really are, are not affected. Um, so that, you know, that's easy to say. It's easy for me to say. It's, it's awfully challenging to, to implement. Um, but there, are, there is some research showing that um, having support for parenting um, through, either through a, ch a child care center or um, through therapy um, can help uh, to decrease uh, your depressive symptoms and also help you to be present in the interaction with the ch your child and focus on reading your child's cues. Um, but most of all, I think the most important thing is take care of yourself first. So happy mom, happy baby. Um, that seeking out mental health services if you're feeling overwhelmed um, is in be your best interest and the child's best interest. Um, and that's true uh, for any kind of depression or anxiety. Um, so there were a lot of pre-submitted questions about that. So I just wanted to spend a little more time um, to cover that. Okay. So now that we've talked a good bit about relationship needs, um, I wanted to move on to talk about another kind of need for brain development, which is nutritional needs. This is a long and overwhelming list. The good news is that if you eat a healthy diet, you're getting most of this in your diet anyway. Um, these are nutrients that are needed for brain development, and brain development is occurring prenatally. It's occurring um, in infancy, and it's occurring you know, once the kid is eating food on their own as well. And at all of these times, they need all these nutrients. This is a reason for taking prenatal vitamins, right? But, um, and eating a balanced diet. Um, and for continuing, if you're breastfeeding, to, for continuing to take those prenatal vitamins and eat a balanced diet while you're breastfeeding. Um, an interesting thing is babies are like parasites, basically. So if you're basically, if, the, if those nutrients are anywhere in your body, they will be sucked out to get into your breast milk so that the baby will get the nutrients that they need, but that may lead to you not having the nutrients that you need. So it's important to be careful with your nutritional intake as well um, while you're breastfeeding in particular. Okay, so um, let me talk a little bit about how nutrients are involved in brain development. Um, they are involved in lots of processes of brain development from building connections between regions to making those connections run more efficiently to getting rid of connections that aren't needed. Um, all those kind of processes rely on um, the right mix of nutrients for them to happen right. Um, and because brain development is happening so rapidly, nutrient deprivation is really problematic when it happens prenatally or in infancy or early childhood. Um, but the good news is, again, that because it's happening so rapidly, if you can get kids the nutritional supplements that they need um, in a timely way, then their, their brain can respond to that. So um, 
The effects of nutrient deprivation on brain development are really complicated. It depends on how old the child is when that's happening, how severe the deprivation is, and how long it lasts for. But the most important point is that you can't fix it retroactively. So if a kid doesn't have, say, iron, uh, isn't getting enough iron um, while they're an infant, and then you put them on iron supplements when they're three, that is not going to erase the effects on the brain. So they, they need the nutrients at the right time. It's a sensitive period when the brain development is happening. They need those nutrients at the right time. So it's something to try to really be on top of to make sure your kid is getting the nutrients that they need. And pediatricians do um, check iron levels so you can get feedback about that to make sure that they're getting what they need. I want to especially talk about iron because it's the most common nutrient deficiency worldwide. Um, you know, most of you, uh, there's a good fortune that you know, your kids probably are not calorie deprived. Right? They're probably getting base, the basics of what they need. But iron deprivation is um, the case in about 25% of infants worldwide and 7% in this country. So it's the most uh, common deficiency. Um, you, you're, you, everybody, including your baby, needs iron um, to carry oxygen to the brain. Um, and if uh, babies and young children are oxygen, um, or iron um, deprived in the first three to five years of life, that means their brain is not getting as much oxygen as it needs, and that can lead to problems in their cognitive and motor development. So it's really quite important. Um, and it needs to happen, the supplementation needs to happen during the early years of rapid brain development if there's not enough iron in the natural diet. So, um, iron deficiency risks vary. You can see in the little chart that toddlers um, overall in the U.S. it's about 7%, um, but certain ethnic groups and immigrant groups have a higher prevalence of this problem, and also low-income toddlers uh, have a higher prevalence of this problem as well. Um, there are some other risk factors listed here if a child is overweight or born preterm or if the uh, mother has certain health conditions. So if your baby feel, uh, or toddler falls into any of these categories, then they are at higher risk. Um, for iron deficiency, but all toddlers and infants, you need to be careful about it. So I've put together for here a list of tips. Um, the reason I'm spending time on iron deficiency is because it can have big effects on your kid and it's really, really easy to fix. Right? It's not something complex. So for infants, if your baby meets one of those criteria on the prior page that means they're uh, at risk, then you might want to talk to your pediatrician about just having routine iron supplementation just for insurance. All infants need to either be having breast milk or iron fortified formula up to age one, no cow's milk before age one. Um, and all infants, um, baby cereal that's fortified with iron starting at six months is a good idea too, just to make super sure that they're getting all the iron that they need. Um, if you have a toddler or a preschooler, you can get them iron um, through iron fortified foods, but also through iron rich foods that are naturally iron rich. And those are actually even better. It turns out that the body absorbs iron somewhat better if it's in foods that it's naturally in as opposed to when it's fortified. So fortified foods are good, but iron-rich foods are even better. Okay, I want to move on to talk about the third, sleep need, uh, the third need for healthy brain development, which is sleep. Um, so sleep promotes brain development. Um, REM sleep, which is um, rapid eye movement sleep, um, is critical for the brain to mature. Um, and it's also important for plasticity, which remembers the brain changing with experience. So while your baby is sleeping, or actually while you're sleeping too, the brain remodels itself uh, based on experience that happened while the child was awake. So um, this is why, for example, if you have a big exam the next day, you should not stay up all night studying because going to sleep will help your brain to consolidate the information that you learned, and, and you'll do better than if you try to um, skimp on sleep. Well, the same thing for sure is true for infants and children. They need sleep. Um, and this may be, some people have suggested that evolutionarily this may be why sleep in the early months of life are so scattered because they're learning so fast and so they need to sleep frequently in order to absorb what they've learned. Um, there's, that's theoretical. Um, but one way or another, we know that, um, that sleep is really crucial, both for infants and older children. So here's a couple interesting studies that can give you a feel for how um, powerful an effect sleep has on learning. So one function of sleep, like I was mentioning, is helping the brain to remember and organize what your baby or child learned while they were awake. And so this is a cool study where they taught kids grammatical rules for a made-up pretend language. 
And then they either let the toddlers nap or they kept them awake and didn't let them nap. And actually it wasn't that they deprived them of their usual nap. It was just that there wasn't, it, they did it so that it wasn't at nap time. So it wasn't that they were exhausted. It was just that there wasn't a nap in there. And what they found out was that toddlers who napped were much better at applying those rules than toddlers who did not nap. So the napping helped them to consolidate and organize the information and to be able to abstract the rules that they had learned. So, you know, there's a lot of evidence recently showing that trying to get your kid to keep napping for as long as possible um, is a good thing. Um, you know, I wish I could still do that. My, my son stopped napping as soon as my daughter was born. So it's, it's tough. You can't always manage it. But um, to the extent that you can try to keep encouraging your child to nap at least some of the time, um, it really is helping, um, first of all, helping them to regulate their behavior and be, you know, everybody can be easier to deal with and happier, but also um, it's helping them to learn. So the second study here um, is showing that when children are deprived of sleep, when they don't get enough sleep, then that gets in the way of their learning and attention. And so what they did is that they assigned elementary school children to sleep one hour less than usual, and then they gave them academic tests the next day. And losing just one hour of sleep a night was equivalent to losing two years of brain development. What that means is that fourth graders who had gotten one hour of sleep less than usual the night before performed the same on the academic tests as second graders who were well rested. So it's a really powerful effect. And so you can imagine what would be the effect on your kid's academic functioning if they're chronically sleep deprived. So if you're having sleep problems, you know, there's, it's important to address no matter what your kid's age is from babyhood on up. So more problems with sleep disruption. Um, it's linked both to medical problems like allergies and ear infections and um, to behavior problems. Um, and so it's, it's something that is affecting brain development. It's also affecting a lot of domains of development. And what are some of the factors that contribute to sleep problems? Um, when bedtimes are late in the evening or inconsistent from day to day, um, this is not so relevant for babies, I hope, but TV sets in the bedroom um, contribute to sleep problems. Um, sleeping in a new environment or um, with a new caregiver, particularly in situations where um, children are being moved to live with someone different, like in foster care, they often develop sleep problems when they're placed, um, when they're separated from a parent and, and placed in a new environment. Um, in a more routine way, like if a parent is away on a business trip, then the, the child may have sleep problems if they're not, if whoever usually puts them to bed isn't there. And um, poverty is a big one. Um, all of the things that I mentioned above are, are more common um, in low-income families. Also things like crowding or more noise in the neighborhood. There are a lot of factors that can come together um, to really contribute to the likelihood of sleep problems um, in babies and all, and all the way up through childhood. So how can you meet your child's sleep needs for healthy development? Well, kids need a lot of sleep. Newborns need 16 to 18 hours. Toddlers need 12 to 14. Preschoolers need 11 to 13. I like to tell people these numbers. Sit down and do the math. Add up how many hours your baby sleeps at night. Don't count the time that they're awake for an hour in the middle of the night, right? Then add up their nap time. Same thing with toddlers and preschoolers. And see if your kid is hitting this window. Now there are individual differences. Some kids need more sleep. Some kids need less sleep. But if your kid's not falling in this window, it's possible that they would be happier and less cranky and be learning better if they were getting a little more sleep. Um, so it's something to think about and kind of do a check to see if, if your kid is getting a developmentally appropriate amount of sleep. Um, consistent bedtime and nap routines um, can help uh, with, with making it easier for your child to fall asleep and stay asleep. Um, and you know, I can also mention uh, that um, there are sleep resources available through ISIS. ISIS has um, phone-based uh, consultations if you need uh, help with sleep problems. Um, there's also a sleep webinar every Tuesday. Um, so, and I forgot to mention that there's a breastfeeding webinar every Thursday. So there's a lot of resources that are available to you that you can seek out. And you know, I wish I had had more of these when I had an infant. It turns out that, that knowing a lot academically about sleep and nutrition does not mean that it is necessarily easy to get your own child to eat and sleep the way that you would like. So seeking help is a good thing um, and will make your life better. So what are the take-home messages from this talk? Um, the first thing that I really want to emphasize is that even though the brain can always change based on experiences, the first few years of life are a sensitive period. And what that means is that they're a prime time when the social and emotional circuits of your baby's brain are being wired based on their early relationship experiences. Um, and so that means try to be in the moment with your kid. You know, when your baby is looking at you across the room and smiling, you know, try to go stop what you're doing and go over there and, and interact with them and, and share that joy with them. That, um, you know, the Harvard Center on the Developing Child calls this serve and return. It's kind of that turn taking of emotional interaction with your child and trying to get really to read your child's cues. Um, 
And that can really help a lot with, um, with helping to develop social brain networks. Um, and so that's something to just try to, to be in the moment and enjoy those moments. And um, that's something that you can really do uh, to facilitate brain development. More than anything, what they need is you. Um, somebody submitted a question that I really liked um, saying, what is the effect on kids' brain development of parents' obsession with iPhones and iPads, the fact that they are you know, all the time distracted? And that is something that hasn't really been researched yet, but I think it is a big concern. Um, you know, we know for one thing that the more words your child hears in the early years of life, the better their language development is likely to be. Well, if you're too busy with your iPhone or iPad that you're forgetting to talk to them a lot, then that's going to have an effect. right? So, and we, as I've been talking about today, the social interaction is super important um, for them. So I think you know, all of us are addicted to our, to our various gadgets, but trying to curtail that and be in the moment with your child is a powerful thing. Um, and sensitive caregiving is especially important to help infants and toddlers to regulate uh, physiological stress, to regulate their stress hormone levels um, until they are about you know, 3, 4, 5 years old. They can't really do it on their own. And so they really need you to be there for them and to help them get through stressful episodes. That does not mean have your child be in a bubble and never be stressed. Uh, we would like our kids to be able to lead charmed lives, but they are not going to. So what we can do for them is to teach them how to manage stress and to be there to comfort them when, when stressful things happen. Um, and then in addition to relationships, other basic needs that are important are good nutrition and adequate sleep um, that are crucial for healthy brain development. And this reminds me um, that we got several questions about controlled crying. And is controlled crying um, as, a, as a strategy for helping children to, to learn to sleep through the night, is that going to have adverse effects on their brain development? Um, there's no evidence that that's the case. Um, and what I want to, to explain is that you want to look at the full context of your child's experience. So if you, know, you are in a very controlled way, very careful way, trying out um, control crying with your child um, in a very, and applying it very consistently. And at the same time, when the child is awake, you are sensitive and responsive and engaged with the child. Um, it seems very unlikely that that would have long-term adverse effects. It's the big picture. And also, I would remind you, your child sleeping is really important for their brain development. So if they're not sleeping, then whether it's control crying or some other approach, you know, doing something to try to improve their sleep is, is going to be important and is going to be valuable for their brain development. Also, if your child's sleeping is so disruptive that you are exhausted, it's going to be really hard for you to be present in the moment with your kids. So taking care of yourself and getting sleep habits that make it easier for you to function and easier for you to engage with your child is going to benefit both you and the child. Okay. Um, so, just to uh, reiterate, these interactions with sensitive, responsive parents, why that's so important is that the effects on your child's brain build a foundation for them to develop social skills, emotion regulation, and attention skills as they get a little bit older. Um, obviously, most of us, many of us, are not the only ones caring for our kids. We have our kids in childcare, and the provision of high quality early childcare is crucial because it's not just you, it's not just mom or dad um, that can do these magical things for your child's brain. It's anyone who is in reg any adult who is in regular social interaction. So making sure that children are in high quality early child care um, where there's a good uh, adult to child ratio and where, the, where you feel like the adults are really engaged with your kid um, is crucial. Um, a nutrition education, keeping an eye on making sure your kid's getting enough iron and enough of the other nutrients, and then consistent bedtime routines and seeking support if you need help in resolving sleep issues. So I want to just uh, talk a little bit about my lab. Um, this kind of research depends so much on uh, parents and on the involvement of parents. We wouldn't be able to, uh, to get these kind of findings if we didn't have um, your help. And we really uh, want to partner with you in learning more about children's development. There's always more to learn. Um, so this is just a quick overview at my lab, the B Lab at Boston University, of some of the studies that we're doing. Um, the SEED study, Social Experiences and Early Development, uh, is a study that involves babies um, 6 to 12 months old and their moms. And we're looking at how moms help their babies to develop social brain networks and to regulate stress. Um, so a lot of what I've been talking about today um, is, some, is what we're exploring in that study. Um, then we are just starting a new study, um, and it's actually in collaboration with Sudha Runachalam, who some of you may have seen her webinar on language learning um, 
in recently. Um, and that is looking at toddlers from 20 to 24 months old, and how do moms help their toddlers to learn language, and how does their brain activity change as they learn new words? So how can we see in the brain that they're learning? Um, so we're really interested again in how their experiences with language are influencing their language learning. Um, and then there's a fourth study, uh, sorry, third study, um, which is a, the MIND study, Mapping Intelligence and Neural Development. Um, that's for four-year-olds, and it's looking at the brain regions that preschool children use to succeed at attention and learning tasks. Um, so we would be beyond thrilled if you were interested in getting involved in any of these studies. Um, and let me just show you on the next slide here. Um, the B-Lab is one of six child development labs at Boston University, um, and they all have research opportunities for children. My lab uh, mostly concentrates on infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. There are other labs that are studying children up to age 12. Um, so uh, there are labs that look at children's understanding of fairness and cooperation, labs that look at children's emotional development. Um, there's even a lab that looks at children's thinking and understanding of concepts like natural selection um, for older kids. So we hope that you'll make a play date with Discovery, that you'll sign up to learn more about opportunities uh, to participate in fun child development studies with your child. Um, we have you know, parking, free parking passes. Um, there's compensation for some of the studies. Um, and you know, we would love to engage with your child. And usually the kids have a pretty fun time um, playing games uh, when they come. So this is the website, and I believe it's also being sent out um, in the links that you'll receive. Um, and so it's a place that you can learn more about our research on this website, and also you could sign up if you want to be contacted to hear about opportunities for your child's age group. Um, I know that some of you that are here in this webinar are not um, local to the Boston metro area. Um, and if that's the case, um, I hope you will look out for um, universities in your city or in your town um, because infant and early childhood research is going on at universities all over the place, um, and they would probably be really excited to hear from you and have you get involved. Um, and it can be you know, exciting to, to contribute to the uh, frontiers of child development research so that um, in future times we'll have new information to report. And now let's move to the question and answer phase. I'm going to uh, hand things back over to Nancy. Thank you so much, Dr. Tarullo, for This is great information. Uh, we do have quite a few questions. We have time to take several of them. Uh, here's a question that is near and dear to my heart. How do different types of toys affect a baby's brain development? So for example, uh, what about battery-operated toys versus open-ended toys or toys like dolls and blocks and things like that? Can you speak a little bit about the types of playthings? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I'd first start by saying that you are the most important thing, and so no matter what the toy is, if you were there playing with the toy with the baby, that's probably the thing that's going to be the absolute best for the baby's brain development. Um, but having a variety of toys is great. Um, kids in the second year of life are starting to develop um, uh, pretend play, and pretend play is, is a really um, wonderful uh, uh, domain of development which has implications for their later uh, social understanding of other people um, and uh, their later cognitive development. So pretend play is a great thing to foster in kids. And so open-ended toys like dolls, um, even like blocks to build uh, castles and have stories going on, dress up clothes, all that kind of stuff um, is great because it fosters um, that kind of creativity. Although actually kids are pretty creative in anything um, they can turn into they can turn into whatever they might want it to be. As you probably know, there's a lot of things that get repurposed. The cushions on my couch are removed from my couch every day to be built into a fort. Um, so there's, you know, there are, um, those open-ended toys have a lot of, of pluses. Um, toys that make music are great too, just because music is, is um, positive for kids' brain development. And you know, we have some of those flashy battery-powered toys in our house too, because it does, it does help when you need to keep your kid entertained when, you, when you're not there to interact with them and you need to, them to just you know, entertain themselves while you're making dinner. But I think the open-ended toys are particularly valuable. Oh, that's great. It supports also what we do in the classroom. And I think um, sensory opportunities are good, and even uh, baby safe and toddler safe art supplies are great. And we always try to remind parents to focus on the process of using things like Play-Doh or crayons. It's not about the product or the finished result. It's about the process and experience of interacting with the, with the so-called art medium. A um, couple of questions about childcare, and I know you spoke a little bit about that, but um, one, one mom participant here wants to know if you have suggestions for working parents 
um, her child are at a high quality child care, but it sounds like she's feeling a little bit of stress or guilt that she's not with them as much during the work week. And then another child care question uh, is from a, a parent who says that their toddler started child care at 16 months. And during the first couple of months, he really had a hard time adjusting and seemed very, very stressed. And she's concerned that this might have actually damaged uh, his brain in terms of development. So and is that the case? And what, what can be done about these types of um, situations when, a, when a, an infant or a toddler is in a child care situation? Great. Okay. I mean, I would first speak to the, the working parent whose uh, child was in high quality uh, daycare to just say that um, there has been a lot of research showing that if your children are in high quality care with a good student teacher uh, uh, ratio and um, with good uh, materials for them to play with and sensitive caregivers, um, there is really no evidence at all that that has any adverse effect on their long term development. And in fact, um, there are some positive effects on them, one being um, social skill development because they have more interaction with peers, and another being, um, interestingly, kids who are in child care end up missing fewer days of kindergarten because their immune systems um, get, get a workout earlier, um, and that means that they, are, they have gotten more of the colds already so that when they start school that they're, they're less vulnerable. Um, so really try to put aside that guilt. As long as you feel good about the child care situation, um, they can thrive without you. <laughs> you know, they, can, they can really um, thrive in that situation, and there's no long-term adverse effects of high-quality child care. Um, and you know, absolutely, you know, most of us, many of us need to work, want to work, um, and there, there's no uh, evidence at all that that has an adverse effect on your relationship with your child. Um, your child is just as likely to have a positive, secure attachment to you. Um, it's about the time, the quality of the time that you do spend with them rather than about you being there every second. Um, the second one about the, um, the child who had a tough transition to daycare. Um, and for that, I would just say what I said earlier about our kids can't leave, live charmed lives. There are going to be stressors, and it's about the big picture. So if the kid is in a loving family, has a sense of responsive caregivers, if the daycare itself is a high-quality daycare and those caregivers are sensitive and responsive to the child's needs, um, the kid is going to be just fine. There, in fact, there's some evidence that mild stressors um, can be a, a positive thing in the long term for kids functioning uh, because uh, if, they, if they don't ever get any exposure to stress, then when they finally do get exposed to stress, they don't know how to cope with it. So you know, don't, don't beat yourself up over that. Um, the kid will be fine, absolutely. That's something that every kid goes through that kind of um, stress at one time or another, and that's very normative. Um, it's about teaching your child coping skills and, and trying to make it so that they're not always in that kind of situation, but they do, there are always transitions in life, and they need to learn how to cope with transitions. So um, there's no reason to be concerned about long-term effects. Yeah, I think you're right that, that these types of uh, repetitive stressors build resiliency because they can have that, that experience, for example, of being dropped off at child care with, a, with a, a caring, familiar caregiver there supporting them. And even if they are crying for the first five minutes, and even if we're continuing to reassure them that mommy will come back, um, they see that happen day after day. It's still very hard for you to, to emotionally deal with it, but they are building resiliency in, in the daily practice of that. And there's a kind of a related question. Um, specific advice for um, parents and caregivers, in this case it's of twins, but it could apply to anybody uh, in terms of helping them regulate frustration. And in this particular situation, one of the twins is more reactive and sensitive to stimula stimulation than the other. So can you talk a little bit about a child who, who either gets overstimulated easily or easily frustrated or just seems to get overwhelmed by sensory input more so than another? Absolutely. So um, one thing is just bringing this back to brain development a little bit, um, that self-control is something that um, develops gradually over childhood. So self-control is controlled by the part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which basically is totally immature when the baby is born. Um, there's a spurt of development and self-control from about age three to six, but it actually continues all the way through adolescence. And all of those of you who have interactions with adolescents probably know adolescents have some impulse control and frustration issues too, um, and their brains are not entirely mature yet. Um, so as parents, if your kid is under three, they're going to have low frustration tolerance. They're not going to have a lot of ability to control themselves. They need a lot, a lot, a lot of scaffolding from you. Um, and this can be hard to remember, especially if you have a kid who's particularly verbal, who talks like they're five. They still have the self-control abilities of whatever age they actually are because their brain just hasn't developed that much yet. Um, and that can be you know, tough to remember in the moment. 
but they need a lot of scaffolding from you. Um, from ages 3 to 6 is a window of opportunity because they now have a little bit more capacity for self-control, and so it's a great time to try to teach some coping strategies, things like how to distract themselves. Um, there are some studies looking at kids' individual differences in frustration tolerance and ability to um, delay getting a reward. Um, and that key skill which is really predictive of later academic and social success, and the kids who do better at it are the ones that don't stare at the prize. Right? Just like kids who deal with frustration better are the ones that don't stare at the broken toy or the dropped ice cream cone. Right? Distraction is key. So teaching your kid to distract themselves can help them to get better at this. Um, also teaching them to um, physically calm their body, things like making them count to 10 or do breathing exercises can help too. Um, the best context for them to learn is in a situation of mild frustration. Um, and what mild frustration is can vary a lot from kid to kid. So it sounds like this parent has twins that are quite uh, different in their frustration tolerance. And one of them might be frustration for something that seems uh, totally understandable, like dropping an ice cream cone that anyone would be upset. And another one, it might be something like, well, they're, you know, they're, uh, the blue shirt is in the laundry, just to take a random example of something that happened to me this morning, right? Freaking out because the blue shirt is in the laundry. And what I found helps in that kind of situation, and what this is empirically supported, it's not just an anecdote, um, is reflecting to the child how they feel, validating their frustration, even if it seems to you that it's something totally trivial and they should just get over it. Telling them to get over it doesn't help. But saying, you are really upset that your blue shirt is in the laundry. It's so disappointing that the blue shirt is in the laundry. That kind of thing um, can give them a word for how they're feeling, and that can, that's one way to help them cope. Um, there are a lot more strategies for managing frustration um, and behavior problems, and that, um, those are in that uh, other webinar that Nancy mentioned that she's going to send you out a link for if you want more detail about that. Thank you. Um, we are we are nearing the end. I actually want to end with this, uh, with this question which I thought was very interesting um, and, and a nice way to wrap up. This, this person asks, what are the signs of a young child's needs being met? We are often given warning signs for when there is a problem, but it would be nice to know the reverse, reassurance that you are doing a good job. And I think that that is a great question because we all know that we hopefully most of us, do the best we can to be nurturing and calm and provide all of the, the needs for our young children, and yet sometimes they don't remain calm and clean and polite and appreciative. They have tantrums. So how do we know watching our children and watching their behavior, how do we know that we are doing a good job? Great. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of dimensions of that. Uh, one is at, at the most basic level, making sure that uh, your kid is meeting developmental milestones, um, and that's something that, you know. I say that and then I say it with a caveat, which is that kids develop in different domains at different rates. And so you don't want to flip out if um, you know, your kid is slightly behind in one domain and, and doing well in other domains um, because you know, some kids are faster on the motor development domain, some kids are faster on language. It just depends on individual differences. So it's not like it's magic that at a certain month they're all going to start doing the same thing. But in a broader way, um, the pediatrician can help with making sure the kid is on track in terms of developmental milestones. Um, things like uh, social engagement with you and social engagement with peers, um, that that's something to keep an eye on to make sure that your kid is happy to see you, that your kid is reaching out to you socially and engaging and is not withdrawn. Is smiling, if in a baby that can be smiling at you, um, you know, while you're changing their diaper uh, or from across the room if your baby doesn't like diaper changes, maybe another time. Um, but connecting with you. Um, in, a, in an older kid, it can be that they're, that they're trying to play with peers and that they're, they're engaging and trying to, trying to connect with them. Um, and um, sleeping is a key one because we know how important sleep is for, for uh, your kid's development. And so the fact that they are going to bed at a consistent time and, and sleeping um, well um, is another key one to keep an eye on. Um, so if, if everything seems to be going well, then I wouldn't worry. That you'll know if there's a problem. Um, and, uh, and otherwise you can feel pretty confident that, that you're doing a great job. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Drua. We have come to the end of our presentation. I wanted to remind people to please check your email uh, either later today or tomorrow. I will send out an email and include links to a variety of our webinars, including the one we've mentioned several times on helping infants and toddlers manage frustration and using positive discipline approaches. Um, and of course, I'll include information about our sleep support program as well. And 
thank you so much to Dr. Tarullo. I certainly hope that people that are local to the Boston area will follow up and check out the Child Development Labs at, at uh, Boston University and maybe participate in some of the studies. Thank you to everybody who's attended, and we certainly hope to see you at another online ISIS webinar event soon.